I had spoken to, and I want everybody, this is like, this is probably one of the best things we've done here in terms of serious stuff. Okay, so I want everybody to watch this. Okay, I had done an interview with a guy by the name of Miguel Perez. We're gonna, this is so good, we're gonna do this in four parts. Oh, wow. Whoa. Okay, so we're gonna watch a little bit about it, we're gonna talk about it, and we're gonna watch a little more about it, and then we'll watch the rest tomorrow. Wow. Okay, wow. this is like the Harry Potter show. I was just okay. clapping right. in right. session. So, right? This is like Harry Potter, <laughs> yeah. we have to come back for two times. Yeah. Now, Miguel Perez, okay, Here's a guy who was basically, I'll give you a little background, okay. okay, before everybody shuts this off. This is really, this is really important stuff, yeah. okay? He, 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 came to, he came from Mexico when he was eight. He lived here, never had a problem. Went to college here, joined the military, and uh, was, not only was he in the military, but he was in the forward bases in Afghanistan uh, during the war in Afghanistan where oh they would God. go out at night and, and be like snipers in the middle of the night nice. hunting, hunting oh. the bad guys, the Taliban. So uh, during one of his tours of duty, a grenade went off right next to him. Several of his comrades died. Uh, he had oh he had some uh, uh, a, 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 a pe all right, no, he did not. He did have that, but he had he had dramatic brain injury. Mm. He had a dramatic oh, yeah. brain injury, and as a result of that, you know, he wasn't able to function well. Came back to America, never knowing, never knowing that he was not. A citizen. I mean, he knew he was a citizen, but he didn't really think anything of it. He said, you know what? Served two tours of duty, never gave any thought to it. Was with a friend uh, who, uh, who, who did a, uh, a small buy and, uh, buy and bust. His friend was, he was with. His friend got caught in a small buy and bust with a small, small amount of drugs. He was in the car when it happened. He went to jail what? and got deported. What? After basically almost risking oh his life God. for the United States of America. Let's watch. Joining us today is uh, Pastor Emma Lozano and Miguel Perez. You may remember Pastor Lozano. She presides over a sanctuary church uh, in Chicago, Illinois. She was recently on our show. Pastor Lozano just returned from Tijuana, uh, where she was trying to assist Miguel Perez. Now, Miguel Perez came to the United States from Mexico with his family legally with a green card at the age of eight. He served two tours of duty in Afghanistan with the United States Army. After receiving a general discharge under honorable conditions, he returned back to Chicago, Illinois, where he found himself struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder from what he experienced in Afghanistan uh, and related drug and alcohol issues that eventually, unfortunately for him, led to his arrest and an aggravated felony charge for a sale of cocaine to an undercover police officer. He was sentenced to several years in jail. He was recently deported back to Mexico on March 23rd of this year, approximately eight or nine weeks ago. He's joining us with Pastor Lozano from Mexico. Pastor Lozano is in Chicago, and they're both joining us today to discuss Miguel's case. Miguel, you're not doing as well as the rest of us, I presume. No, not really. Uh, I'm doing this day to day. Right. So you are in Tijuana, Mexico right now, correct? That is also correct. Yeah. And Pastor Lozano, how are you? Welcome back to our show. And you are you are uh, skyping in from Chicago, Illinois. That's that's correct, and I'm doing fine. And I just um, am worried about Miguel. Of course, of course. So let's find out a little bit about him first. You came to the United States at age eight. Why did your parents move here from Mexico? My father played semi-professional soccer, and he had they offered him a job with a soccer team from Chicago, the Chicago Sting. That that team's no longer in existence, but that's the reason that we came and we came here legally because my grandfather's a natural born citizen of the United States. And when you came here, where did you reside? In Chicago. And and you grew up in Chicago? You went to high school in Chicago? Yes, I went to grammar school, uh, first to eighth grade, uh, four years of high school and college in Chicago. Where did you go to college in Chicago? St. Augustine College. Okay, and did you you get a you get an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree? I actually finished. Uh, I was a, a few credits short of my associate's, and I I finished my associate's while in prison. I understand. And at what point 
Uh, and I assume up to the point when you joined the military, you never had any issues with, with uh, the law. Is that correct? That's correct. Just minor stuff. Okay. When you joined the military, what, how old were you and what year was this? This was in 2001. It was April 2001. I joined up by around my 23rd birthday. And this was right before 9-11. What, what made you want to join the U.S. military? Well, uh, my grandfather's side of the family, there's a lot of uh, military... We come from a military family. Uh, his uh, cousins and uncles, they served in, from World War II, Korea, Vietnam. So when I was little, I used to uh, uh, go to California to Disneyland in Sacramento, Anaheim area. And I would sit there and listen to their stories. And I always I always grew up thinking uh, that I wanted to join the military at one point. Plus, I also, I felt the duty. I felt civil duty to defend the country. Even if we were not at war, if there was some war time, I felt that the training was necessary just in case something would happen in the future. And 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 so you come from a long family and history of family members who honorably served the United States in World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. When you entered the U.S. military, were you aware that you were not a citizen of the United States despite the fact I knew you wanted to, you know, you had your civic duty or felt the civic duty to represent the United States? That is correct. The only thing that, that I thought was the difference between a, a permanent resident and a citizen was the duty, uh, jury duty, and the right to vote. Right. That was the only thing. So, so you never gave thought ever that the United States would never be your home for the rest of your life? Oh, absolutely not. And so when you joined the military, you went into basic training? That is correct. I went into basic training, and then I went to AIT. What is AIT? AIT is Advanced Individual Training. The, the school the school that the Army provides for where your job is going to, what your MOS is going to be. Uh -huh. And the day that I, I graduated uh, from AIT, September 11th, 2001, about 8.30 in the morning, as, as the first plane was hitting the Twin Towers. That must have been scary for you, I guess. You said, okay, it's on now, right? That is correct. When uh, we marched back from the chapel to the, to the main barracks, and that's when we were informed that the United States was under attack. And what I initially thought was that it was just uh, a speech that they give to everybody that's graduating to, you know, to let you know that this might happen any given time. But a few minutes later, we, we found out that it was, it was just too real. A day later, I went to Georgia to Fort Benning for a uh, for airborne school. For airborne school. Of airplanes. And and That's how correct. long was that? That was three weeks. Was that the first time you ever jumped out of a plane? That is correct. Scary? Absolutely, yes. I I, I got kicked out the first time, kicked out the plane. Right, right, because you didn't um, want to well, jump. Correct. And and then I know just from the history of 9-11, it was only several weeks later that President George W. Bush went on television and said that we are now going to go to war against Afghanistan. How long after that presidential speech were you were you shipped off to Afghanistan? I was in Afghanistan in March 2002. Okay, so approximately six, seven months into the war, you got shipped off to Afghanistan. That is correct. And what was your job for the military in Afghanistan? What were you required to do? My initial job was to be a lightweight mechanic, which is a quick fix for, for humbings. For example, flat tire or overheating. It's just quick fix for, for when something's wrong with the truck. But when we got to Afghanistan, uh, I took a whole different role. I I got put with, a, with the Special Forces team guys and I was shipped out to their fire bases. Fire bases is just small, small little bases out in the in the middle of nowhere, really. And, um, and we took, I took different types of jobs. So the main job that I had was operating the 50 caliber on top of the Humvee. So you were sent out into basically the forward positions where they had small little camps in the middle of nowhere, and then you had to go out on missions and operate the gun on top of a Humvee, like a little Jeep. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And, and that was, is correct. That, was that for offensive purposes, or was that for protection of troops going in and out of the, out of the camp? It was uh, for offensive reasons. Right. Uh, the unit, it was for more like uh, seek and destroy. Uh -huh. It was uh, the unit that I was in concentrates uh, on getting certain uh, targets. 
So you, you were seek and destroy the enemy. I guess you would go out at night. Uh, I remember the you know the U.S. military had a had a much bigger advantage because they had the night goggles and you were doing a lot of raids at night. I would assume is that correct? That is correct. Right. And how many raids do you think you know seek and destroy raids that you went on in your first tour of duty there in Afghanistan? Maybe about ten. There's different uh, operations. There's small operations and then there's big operations. So some of them really don't don't count. We had operation. Uh, I don't know if they're classified still. But there's like Operation Alaconda, uh, different operations. Right. And on each of these missions, were you required to fire your gun at somebody? Not not on every single mission. But on some uh, of them, you yeah. did. That is correct. And and w do you recall um, if you you killed enemy combatants? It's it's really hard to you tell. You don't know. It's possible. Yes. You don't know what bullet it was. And correct. can do you, on your first tour of duty. And, and if it's too difficult or too hard or too emotional, can you tell us, you know, something that, you know, keeps you up at night or that you that you remember that 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 really is upsetting to you about what you experienced or what you saw? Yeah, it's kind of hard. But uh, one of the main things that, that keeps coming back to me is the smell, the smell of blood and, and, uh, and bone fragments and uh, maybe a 12. 11, 12 year old a boy that was uh, split in half by a 50 caliber at close range. And that's one of the main, one of the main things that, that's uh, reoccurring. Um, in, in your mind? Also, that is correct. That's, that's the main, because of my son and because of my daughter. So it's just, at the time it was, it was just, it didn't matter really. It was more adrenaline at the time, I assume, correct? And you came back and you were, I guess, high on adrenaline. That is correct because you think that you're doing the right thing and everybody is below you. Right, because it's so either it's, because and if you didn't do the right thing, you would have been dead, or your colleague or your 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 friend next to you would have been dead. That is correct. And 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 how long were you in Afghanistan on your first uh, go around? I returned in October. And you returned, so you were there for about six months. You did about ten missions. You definitely saw combat. You were on seek and destroy. You came back. What was it like to come back to the United States? You have you have a you have a wife. You have children. Tell me about your family here. Um, the the first uh, on the first return, everything was still everything was fun and everything was still adrenaline. I came back to Chicago to spend some time with my daughter and and my wife. Uh, we weren't married at the time. We were just. Uh, which is my, my daughter's mother. Right. We spent some time, but, but most of the time it was just partying because of the six months that we were back, it was like to regroup. And I was only, we were only attending formation Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So every week was a four day weekend. So right. I was going down to Florida, Myrtle Beach, a lot of partying, a lot of, uh, a lot of stress release. Sure. And then you got the call back to go back to Afghanistan again. Is that correct? That is correct. You didn't have an option to say no. You had to go back. There's always a, a, an option. There's always an option. You can uh, say no. Uh, you can refuse. So there's there's consequences. But uh, but there was no reason for me to refuse. I, I kind of wanted to go back. And I, the, the second time going back is when I actually, before I left, about three weeks before I left, I got legally married my daughter's mother mm -hmm. for purposes because there was just a small feeling that I might not be coming back. Right. And the reason that we got married was just to, uh, just a peace of mind. Peace of mind. And of course, she would be able to get benefits from the government should you, anything, God forbid, happen to you. Correct. Now, you got married. You went back to Afghanistan when? I guess this would be fall of 2003. Yes, that's uh, April, beginning of April. A April 2003. And did you go back to the same position again, or did you have a different position now? The same thing. The, the same thing. We're attached to uh, to the teams. They're called teams. It's a 12-man team that they have, the, the Green Berets, the Special Forces. And they attach either a mechanic and a cook to them to go out on a, to go out on the different fire bases. And, and were you on the same fire base or a different fire base? On different fire base. The main fire base that I was in was called Firebase Gecko, southeast of uh, southeast of Kandahar. 
and you did the same exact thing again. You went out on night raids and you engaged the enemy and some nights nothing happened and other nights I assume there was a firefight. That is correct. And how long did you stay in Afghanistan for the second tour? Also till October. Uh, it was the same, uh, the same rotation. I was there till uh, the end of October 2003. Okay. And then at that point, I, I understand from the notes, you were honorably uh, discharged from the military. Is that correct? A year later, you know, August, to the, uh, August 2004. Okay. So, but you did those two tours. That is correct. All right. So Miguel so far, he comes to the United States mm -hmm. as a green card holder. His grandfather served in World War II. All of his relatives, uncles, served in the Korean War, Vietnam War. Uh, the only reason why he, he wasn't you know, a U.S. citizen is his father was a soccer player, moved back to Mexico to play soccer, mm -hmm. and then came back to the United States um, when Miguel was eight years old. Right. Miguel entered with a green card. He assumed his family's all citizens. He has a green card. He never really bothered with anything. He says a civic duty, especially after 9-11, to go join the U.S. military and fight for the country that he loves. And he does, and he goes to Afghanistan, and he's not peeling potatoes <laughs> in the kitchen in the back. Right. He's on forward bases yeah. going out on kill missions to go kill the enemy for the United States of America, protecting for what we understand to be our rights and our liberty here in the United States of America, protecting everybody in the United States of America to be safe. That was why he went. Right. He's now living in Tijuana, Mexico. Jonathan. It's just, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not usually speechless, but this is, um, it's just sad. Like, I, I can't imagine just knowing what your life is supposed to be like when you asked him, did you ever think that you would ever not live in the United States? Never like, gave a thought. Yeah. Never gave a thought. Because, because, and I put myself, this is the thing with situations like this. You have to put yourself in that situation. You know, um, me being born here, um, you know, with my family being from Africa, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, like, I'm putting myself in this situation, say that they were in the war, and I, you know, just thought that, hey, I'm American, hey, I want to live this American dream, I want to uh, fight for my country. Well, well how about this? I, I'm fighting for, I lived here since I was eight years old, and I've joined the military, and I'm fighting for the United States of America. Risking why, my life. Why in the world would you ever think you wouldn't. You would get deported, you wouldn't. ever. Right. You wouldn't. Now, now, what's said is what you're going to hear about is the problems about m people who were in the military in combat coming back to the United States. You know, you think about it. We're going to hear about this in about 30 seconds or so. You know, think about if you were going out on a raid in the middle of the night and you could be killed at any moment. You're, you're in a firefight for your life with everybody else. Think about, you know, if, you, if you're even on, like, um, what, Fortnite now. I don't know if you ever right. played Fortnite, yeah. okay? Right. But, I mean, it's very intense, and your life is on the line. The adrenaline rush that you have, especially when you come back, right. uh, is, is, is second to none. You, I can't even probably picture it. Now come back to the United States. Where's that adrenaline rush coming from? Yeah, it doesn't uh, come from anywhere. You yeah, you you're, you're, you're mowing the lawn. You're, you're changing baby diapers. There's no adrenaline rush anymore. So this is why people have these post-traumatic stress disorders, because they're not getting that adrenaline rush anymore. Why you see a lot of people in the military turning to alcohol and drugs. It's a Suicide. psychological problem. Yeah. It's a psychological problem the U.S. military is not taking care That's of, what I was about especially... To say, yeah especially for immigrants yeah. who put their life on the line. They barely mm -hmm. take care of the, the soldiers, the Correct. American soldiers now. So. so let's let's watch to see what happened. Mm -hmm. I guess everybody, as they grow up, has some sort of, you know, casual alcohol use or even casual drug use, right or wrong. When did it start to get out of control for you? And why was it getting out of control? Well, uh, upon my second return, it was alcohol. Alcohol was always involved after the the first return, but it was drugs, especially powder cocaine, came into play after my second return. And I, you come back to the United States, and everything is slow. Everything is slow. Uh, it's as far as it's a combination of everything, the people's action, and everything is slow, but at a fast pace. I, 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 I understand. You go from you go from this exhilaration, this rush of 
exhilaration that you're shooting and people are shooting at you and your life could be over or someone else's life can be over and, and the adrenaline and the exhilaration to come back to, I guess, mowing the lawn and cooking the dinner. That is correct. And then you see people in a hurry and do nothing. Like you see people crossing the street or just speeding and it's just, especially in the city, you see commotion and everything and you're like, why? You know, like, what's this all about? You just confused right and uh the only the only time that uh that i was able to to be relaxed was under the effects of uh, alcohol and uh and powder cocaine right and and i guess the powder cocaine gave you that adrenaline adrenaline rush that that you were missing from being out in the field to feel awake correct did your wife notice a change in you or your family notice a change in you yes because upon my return uh after getting out the military and coming back home I did not move back in with uh with my wife. We just uh, we went problems. our separate ways. Yes, I would just I would see my daughter anytime I wanted on the weekends or every day after school. But we were no longer living together. Did anybody in your yeah. family try to get you help? Uh, at first, my mother would tell me something was wrong, but I was uh, I was in denial. I didn't really express anything, so I was I would disappear a lot, and they thought that I was out with friends, maybe partying right. or. And, and also my friends, they thought that I was at home because I didn't come around. But the truth was that I was just by myself most of the time. And did anybody in the military hear you serve two, two tours of duty? You were honorably discharged from the military. Uh, what was their role in trying to help you to re reacquaint yourself, I guess, or re re put you back into society at a slower pace? or reacquaint yourself back in society without the alcohol and drugs, or nobody ever checked on you on that from the military side? Um, no, there was no transition period. There was no transition period. They have, like, at that time, they weren't, it wasn't like it is now. I see now that they have a lot of programs. Back then, it was just maybe a, a half-hour class or an hour class where you just you just talk about feelings, and, and it was just something very minimal. And, but nobody ever checked on you, hey, you're doing okay, you're having a problem with drugs or alcohol. It was just you came back, thank you very much for your service, goodbye. Yes, pretty much, yes. At what point you were arrested? Tell us about what happened there and how, how you ended up going from using drugs and alcohol to what was alleged to have been an undercover sale of cocaine to a police officer, to an undercover police officer. Upon my return from uh, the military in, uh, when I was in Chicago, I met with a childhood friend, and and he was a drug dealer. But uh, I would affiliate with him just to go out to parties, and it was what well, it was free drugs for me, free drugs and and free party. So every time that I needed anything, I would just call him. We would get together, maybe go to the casino or hang around for a little bit. And every time I would leave, I would leave the drugs. That's what it was. It was like that for a while. And this happened in 2008. When uh, by that time I had met somebody else, and my son was born, and me and my uh, my son's mother were fighting because of the same thing again. She was telling me, you know, that there was something wrong, that I needed to get help, that I needed to go to the VA hospital. So this is five years of a downward, or four years of a downward spiral into drugs and alcohol. And although your family tried to intervene, no one from the military ever even called you once. No, my mother was the first one that started pushing me to go to the VA hospital around at the end of 2006 and the beginning of 2007. Only because your mother told you to do so. That is correct. And when we went to the VA hospital, the first time they told me to come back in about a month or a, a month or two. When I came back, they gave me a bunch of medication. I cannot recall what the medication was, but it was a, a lot of medication. And then they scheduled me to come back in a few months or when I was having any episode and my mother would take me, I would have to sit there maybe for like hours and then it was going to be like a 16 hour wait. Mm -hmm. So I would just take off. What was the test that they did for you? And, and you don't know what they were treating, they were, what were they treating you for? Were they treating you for drug dependence or were they treating you for something else? They, they did an MRI or a CAT scan and they, they were treating me for PTSD. They were treating me for back pain. They were treating me for TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury. 
Wh how mm -hmm. did you get a TBI? That's that's a very serious thing. Did, did you get? Did you fall or get hit in the head while you were on duty? Uh, it was a. Uh, it was different. It was multiple explosions. One one incident. It involved a flashbang grenade blowing up right about here. And a flashbang grenade is uh, it's it's like a concussion grenade. It's the one that uh, you throw to stun everybody. And one of the local children uh, found one. And I would never know if he thought that it was a real uh, explosive grenade that he did just to take us all out. Or maybe he thought it was some sort of a toy. And he pulled the pin and, and it blew. And he blew his skin off. And you could see, you could see a little bit of, of his bones. And it happened right here. And when that happened, uh, I was out. I was out. It was a, a concussion. And also, I fell off the truck because there's no, we didn't carry doors. There's no doors on the Humvees. Is, is this the second tour of duty or the first tour of duty this happened? This is the second one. Second one. Now, and were they treating you at the VA hospital? Did, you, did they know about your drug dependence as well? Or that, or that was really not discussed at all? Uh, not really. It wasn't really difficult. It was really just your post-traumatic stress disorder. You had a dramatic brain injury, and they were treating you for that. And they just gave you a pill and said, come back in two months. That is correct. Outside of the pills they gave you, and you went back and forth for, I guess, you know, to, for a checkup, did they do anything else for you? No. Nothing? No, no, not at the time. No, it was under construction. It was a lot of things going on. They had the, there was, there's two hospitals in Chicago, one in, May, one in Maywood and the other one, uh, close to downtown Chicago. One of them was under construction and the other one was almost finished. So it was a lot of uh, running, running around. Basically, you're being treated at the VA at the, most, at, the most, at the most basic minimal level and you've been going on a downward spiral of drugs and alcohol for years. The VA doesn't even know about it. No doctor's treating you for it. And you now wind up in a situation where you're handing drugs over to an undercover cop. Were you aware of what you were doing at that moment? I, I want to say yes, but I was under the effects of, of alcohol and drugs. And what happened, I, I was not even supposed to be there that day. You were, you were under uh, the effects of what? which drugs? The drugs that the VA gave you or just cocaine and alcohol? Uh, cocaine and alcohol and a little bit of the ones that the, the VA gave me. It was some muscle relaxers, I believe. My friend was under investigation for like nine months. They had a, they had recorded buys. They, in the day that they decided they were going to take them in, that's the day that I was with them. Your, oh, so your friend. They were, they were following your friend and you just happened to be with him at that moment. That is correct. Right. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't home for like three days because of a fight with my son's mother. So then I was staying at his house. And when he was going to go drop me off at my son's mother, we, we stopped. That, that's when, that's uh, when the arrest happened. And had, yes, had you not right. got into a fight with your son's mother, you wouldn't have been in the wrong place at the wrong time and we would not be talking to you in Tijuana, Mexico. That is correct. So when you, when you went, you were charged in federal court or in state court? State court. State court. Did your criminal defense attorney bring up, a, you know, because you have to show, you know, that you had the intent, you had the mental culpability to be, to know what you're doing, which is selling drugs to an undercover cop. Did he bring up or she bring up the fact that you had a, uh, not only post-traumatic stress disorder, but even, even more, a, a traumatic brain injury, plus you were on all different kinds of medication, including muscle relaxers and other medication the VA gave you. Was that brought up in terms of your, your mental state and what you were doing at that moment? No, it wasn't. I asked the attorney once, I was like, can we mention to the lawyer, uh, to, the, to the judge that, uh, that I'm a United States Army veteran and all this issue? And he advised me not to. He told me that if the judge were to find out that I served in the military, that he was going to say I should have known better and he was going to give me more time. Maybe. I mean, I, I don't know the judges in Chicago, but I would say that certainly the fact that when you have a dramatic brain injury, your brain is not functioning at the level in which it should be for your age and, and gender. So certainly it diminishes, you know, what your mental capacity was in terms of your intent. Now, something to look at down the line. Perhaps maybe even one of my criminal defense attorneys can look at it as well. 
because ultimately, I mean, I mean, I don't want to get into your the, all of the legal issues at this moment, but ultimately, you're only going to come back to the United States either as a United States citizen, or if you can vacate that conviction, or or have a senator. I know Senator Duckworth is in your corner, um, or have a senator make a private bill. That is correct. Also, death. Decision. Death. Right. Right. Death. When you die, you can go into Ar Arlington Cemetery. So now you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You, you plead guilty to what in court in Chicago? It was called manufacturing delivery. In the state of Illinois, if it's, if it's packaged, it's a manufacturing delivery. And that's what, that's what I pled guilty to. Also, my co-defendant had a, he was out on bond and he fled the country. He fled to Mexico. So he, he, and, he's uh, still on the run. He's dead. He's and dead he, now. He was killed in Mexico in 2012 while I was in prison. And how long were you in prison? Seven and a half years. And in the seven and a half years in prison, how did you get treated for your post-traumatic stress disorder? How did you get treated for your drug and alcohol dependence? And how did you get treated for your traumatic brain injury? I think, I think that going to prison is probably the best thing that ever happened. I mean, I understand that it has the consequences that I'm here now, but as far as my physical health, it was probably the best thing that could ever happen because uh, I started seeing a psychiatrist once a month, a psychologist twice a month, group meetings, alcohol and substance abuse programs. And I started how to, learning how to deal with, with what was going on with my life. And, and I've been drug free since the day that I entered prison. And you haven't touched it since? Not at all. And now, unfortunately, you pled guilty to an aggravated felony. And what the law says is if you, it is an aggravated felony to, uh, to uh, manufacture and sell uh, narcotics. If you're found guilty of an aggravated felony after April of 1996 as a lawful permanent resident, despite your military service, it's an automatic deportation unless you can show your life is in danger in Mexico. Did you feel your life was ever gonna be in danger in Mexico because your friend got killed? I'm still pretty much, I'm uh, still in danger. All right, so basically, you know, what, what we learned is, is that he, he did two tours of duty in Afghanistan. On his second tour of duty, beso besides all of the uh, stress of going through, uh, you know, these offensive missions in the middle of the night, killing the bad guys, um, there were several grenades, he said more than one, yeah. that went off near him that ultimately gave him a traumatic brain injury as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. He goes on a drug and alcohol binge when he comes back, you know, just from everything that went on. The VA hospital doesn't do anything to help him except give him more drugs. His wife finally throws him out of the house that he had children with, says, I can't deal with this anymore. And he's stupid enough to go live on the couch of his best friend, who happens to be a drug dealer under investigation by uh, local law enforcement or the U.S. Attorney's Office or whoever ended up ultimately arresting him. And he just happens to be sleeping on the guy's couch and going around with him for a couple of days when the feds or the state of Illinois decide to bust him. He ends up seven and a half years in jail and, and he, he's talking to us from Tijuana, Mexico. It's, it's absolutely not only insane, completely unfair yeah. uh, what happened to him. Now, obviously... He did wrong, and he served seven and a half years in jail. But don't you think that's punishment enough Absolutely. For, for what he's done for the United States of America? Absolutely. Um, we're going to find out tomorrow. We're going to find out tomorrow how his deportation process went, how he ended up back in Mexico, and what he's doing now. So please watch tomorrow for the second half of our interview with Miguel.